Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Servants HM podcast. We're really excited for next week because we're going to be premiering our documentary on Father Henry in English. It's already come out in Spanish, so please help us to get that out there because he's an example of, uh, in my opinion, a priest. How our Lord um, wants a priest to be. When he thinks of a priest, he thinks of Father Henry. So we're going to be putting that link in the description below. Also, a link to the documentary Unstoppable Waterfall, which is a documentary on Garibandal. So a lot of you would have questions on Garibandal, why they keep going on about Garibandal, is it even approved by the church, and a big etc. The documentary says it all, and it is very enjoyable and easy to watch. So please check that out as well, because Marian apparitions are very important. You have to believe them to go to heaven. No. But Yes, in the sense that they're very important, in the sense that she comes down from heaven to give us messages in very conflicting and troubled times. So think of Lourdes. Lourdes, you know what? You're not even 100 years after the French Revolution. 1858, Lourdes happened. 1789 was the French Revolution where they enthroned the goddess of reason in Notre Dame, a prostitute on the altar. And they were saying, hail goddess of reason. Yes, reason, you are our new goddess. We're going to worship you. And Our Lady appears to a small, asthmatic, um, illiterate, illiterate girl, and she has her eat grass and drink muddy water in front of hundreds of spectators in the age of reason, where there's everything's reason, and look at what she's doing, the most unreasonable thing. And now you have Lourdes. Millions and millions of people go there every year on pilgrimage, and millions are healed through the miraculous waters. Fatima, totalitarian regimes communism wiping out and our lady once again comes down and she says pray the rosary for peace this is right after the first world war second world war was on the horizon pray the rosary for peace kibejo rwanda rivers of blood will be flowing the hutsis and the tutsi tutsis and the, the two tribes in rwanda massacred massacres and also rivers of blood were flowing so our blessed mother is our mom she's worried about us she comes down to tell us these things in these times and that's where you have garabandal and this is where garabandal comes in uh garabandal is simultaneously going on at the same time as the second vatican council 61 to 65 was garabandal 62 to 65 was the council and they're going on at the same time so huge um, problems, um, huge ruptures um, from after, sorry, after Vatican II, not from after Vatican II. Yes, uh, you have 17,000 priests leave the priesthood. Over 25,000 religious as well leave their convents, leave their, their perpetual vows. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. And Our Lady said in her second message, and this is where I want to zone in today, um, Our Lady's second message of Garibandal and the priesthood, because as Monsignor Laval said, he was one of the, the bishops during the time of Garibandal, he says, look, everything there is sound as far as theological, you know, doctrine, it's all good. It's just that second message, that part in the second message where Our Lady, she mentions priests, cardinals, I'm sorry, priests, bishops, and cardinals on the way to perdition. And bringing souls with him. It's that part that I just can't get. And, you know, you think about it. You're, you're in the 60s Spain. This is not long after their Spanish Civil War, where priests and bishops, hundreds of priests and bishops, were being martyred for their faith. These guys were saints, heroes. You, you get your hand kissed as a priest. You still do in Spain. There's some parts that they see the cassock, they'll kiss your hand. Other parts, they might spit on you. Um, the cassock in Spain is is very, it is black and white, literally, you know. <laughs> You're not going to get any middle ground. So you, you have these priests and bishops that are just, they are canonized in life. These, these, these figures are saints. And these illiterate girls in the middle of nowhere Spain are saying that many of them are leading souls to perdition, and they themselves are on the road to perdition. This is unthinkable. It was such a hard message that the girls couldn't even do it. They couldn't say it. They had a priest read it, 
Father Luna, and he himself left out the bishops and the cardinals part because he's like, I can't say that. And it was being translated into many languages. You had ten to 15,000 people there when this second message was read. You know, you're talking about a town that didn't even have roads to get up there. This was unbelievable. And it was also in a crisis point of Garabandal as well. She had stopped appearing to the, the three other seers. It was only to Conchita. And this was a couple years after her first message. And people were thinking, oh, like, Garabandal yeah, it's on the down. It's, it's, it's over. And then all of a sudden she comes with the second message. The angel Michael, St. Michael has to say it, who she would say later to Conchita. She says, this message gave me too much pain. I couldn't say it myself. It was too hard for me to deliver as your mother. So I'm just going to read the text of the second message and we'll get into it. Since my message of October the 18th has not been heeded and made known to the world, I tell you that this is the last one. Before the cup was filling up, now it is brimming over. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are following the way to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Ever less importance is being given to the Holy Eucharist. You must turn the wrath of God away from you by your efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with a sincere heart, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through St. Michael the Archangel, wish to tell you to amend your lives. You are now in the last warnings. I love you very much, and I do not want your condemnation. Ask us sincerely, and we will grant your plea. You must make more sacrifices Reflect on the passion of Jesus. Um, like I said, this was a bomb. And it wasn't even read in its, in its entirety, leaving out the bishops and the cardinals. Unthinkable at that time. Now people hear that and they say, okay, yeah, well, like, what else is new? You know, like, okay, cardinals and bishops uh, going down the, you know, the road of perdition. You know, it's sadly that's something that is is now thought of as as normal. And this is this is where we're in trouble. This is where we're in a lot of trouble because the cardinals, the bishops, and the priests are the church in the sense that they are the shepherds. And you strike the shepherd, you corrupt the shepherd, and you're going to get the flock. As Fulton Sheen says, no ordained minister goes into the afterlife alone. He always will be accompanied by his flock into the afterlife. So if this is heaven or hell. You're not going alone. We're not going alone. And in corrupt shepherds, like this isn't something that is in the 60s, okay? Like after Vatican II, you know, all of a sudden you have these really weird things going on, clown masses, you know, priests. What's the deal with priests not wearing their cler clerics anymore? You know, priests going undercover, like like just dressing like everybody else, or your nuns as well, just distasteful um, garb. <laughs> You know, you could still distinguish them. You still know they're nuns, you know, just because they're wearing distasteful garb. Like, why don't you just, why weren't you sticking to what you were, were, what was distinguishing you? You know, what is the deal here? Like, we have to, like, be like the world, you know what I'm saying? Like, we have to take off the garb. That, for me, I never understood. But this is not something in the 60s. This goes back before Christ. Ezekiel 34, our Lord, through the prophet, says, Speak to my shepherds. They're abusing the flock. They're getting gain off of the sheep. They're eating the fat ones. They're warming themselves with their wool. And later on, he prophesies, I myself will shepherd my flock. I myself will come down and become their shepherd. This is, this is something that is age old in, in the prophets. In um, you have Augustine as well, the Church Fathers. He's commenting on this constantly. What we need to do as shepherds: stop abusing of your role as a shepherd, and get in there for the flock, with the flock, walk amongst the flock. This image of smelling like sheep is beautiful. That means that you're in there with with the the sheep. You know what they they're going through, their misery. You don't smell like them because you yourself are in misery. You smell like them because you're close to them. So Our Lady coming down and saying this, this is the crux of the problem. Like I said, priests, bishops, and cardinals. And when I say they're the church, I mean like this right here is, this is the heart. Because the priest is the love of the heart of Christ. The priest is Christ's best friend. So you're getting in there and you're rupturing that. You're breaking that. You're getting loads. You're not just getting an individual. You're getting the whole army with you. You're taking out the general. And the concern of our Blessed Mother is, is fierce. Garabandal is a Eucharistic apparition as well because she's constantly talking about the Eucharist, the Eucharistic miracles, miracles. If there was a priest present in the town, the girls wouldn't receive communion. If there wasn't, 
they would receive by the hands of the angel, but the angel would not bring them communion if there was a priest available. You know that famous um, saint, I don't know, I think it was St. Jose Maria Escrivá who said like if it was, he had this vision like his angel after his ordination stopped going through the door before him and he asked him why. He says, now that you're ordained, you go, I go after you. You know, the figure of the priest, they go after you. Like um, it, the the apparitions to the priests as well, there would be a lot of priests that would go to Garabandal undercover and our Blessed Mother would have the girls go up to them and they would bless them in a special way or they'd give them the cross to kiss it in a special way. Like I said, priests that would would try to go undercover, but our Blessed Mother would send them right off, the visionaries, to the priests right away to, to recognize their dignity, to recognize their priesthood. Many priests were brought back into their vocation after visiting Garabandal. And the emphasis that our Blessed Mother put on there, when she asked Conchita what she wanted most, um, it was like a favor she could have gotten from God, she says, the sanctification of priests. Because if the priests are holy, the people will be holy. If you have a holy priest, you're going to have holy people. If you have an unholy priest, it's going to affect the people. Look at the Mass right now, okay? Look at, look at the situation that we're getting, going on with the Mass. If, if a Mass is celebrated sloppy and where there's no faith and the priest is just up there, that affects the people. Day in and day out. After that, it's, it's, it's something that you're living and you're, you're taking in. He doesn't believe in that. It's slowly affecting my faith in this until the point where you don't believe in it either. Sloppy communions mishandling of the Eucharist. Um, a lot of people are, are complaining to me and they're asking me about the whole the whole thing of Eucharistic ministers. We could go into that for ages. I mean, the Eucharistic minister is, you have to have three conditions to have a Eucharistic minister. Either there's no priest, deacon, or acolyte present at the Mass. So there's a, an, an extraordinary minister that comes in to deal out communion. The priest is too old and too feeble to get up and hand out the communion. So you have an extraordinary minister that comes in and helps. Or there's so many people that the Mass would go on forever and you need help through an extraordinary minister. I was doing missions in Ecuador and I've never seen more people at Mass. And we would appoint two acolytes to help us. Um, when there wasn't an acolyte, it was a brother that I would just I would give him the special blessing. People would come up around the rail and we would go through the people left and right. And uh, I've never seen anything more efficacious and, and, and quick as far as like you know, everybody was receiving communion in a very dignified manner as well. I mean, I've been in Mass where I've had the Eucharistic minister tell me that I can sit down because they've got it. It's okay. I've got this, Father. Like, people, that affects their faith. That affects their faith. And sometimes we can get, just get into this mentality like it's a function or it's a job and it needs to just happen. We'll get it done. And we become kind of like functionaries. And that affects their faith. Like, the, the way I celebrate is important because they're they're depending on on that you know that's 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 a huge part of the priest the art of celebrating so extraordinary minister they come in when they're when those conditions are met and um like i said i've had a lot of people they just it's hard it's hurtful for them they say because it's just the the the, the just the dealing of the eucharist and the way that they're they're dealing it they're kind of handing it out and it's just like it, it, it gets sloppy it gets very sloppy. So that hasn't been something that the church has, after Vatican II, all of a sudden, it's something that we do. Pope Paul VI was very firm on it. He he wrote to all the bishops um, very shortly after the council with his concerns, saying that there's been many abuses. Mysterium Fide, a document that he wrote, he says there's been many abuses in this area of the liturgy, of the way that we're handing out the Eucharist, the way we're celebrating the Mass. This is not what the Spirit, this is not what the council intended. So don't go blaming the Vatican II and saying this is all fruit of Vatican II. It's it's fruit of bad interpretations and it's fruit of, of a lot of bad theologians, bad priests after the council that led a lot astray. Like I said, 17,000 priests gone, over 25,000 religious. In Spain, it, you, you would have had an average of 8,000 seminarians a year, major seminary. In 10 years, that went down to 1,000. Dried up. Dried up. I think, look, I think it makes perfect sense, right? You get the priest... And you've got the flock. Get the priest to stop believing in his vocation. To stop looking at himself as a mystery. If you can do that, you've got everything. So what do you do? You get the priest from someone who's ministering sacraments of salvation. Because at the measure that the priest ministers these sacraments, he confesses the anointing of the sick. He celebrates Mass. The measure that he does that is the measure that his faith grows. The, the priest 
is united to his ministry in such a way that when those sacraments stop happening or you lose faith in them, you lose your vocation in the sense that you just become a functionary, administrating. You're administrating. Get the priest to administer, be, be like some kind of like um, head, and he's office working, he's administrating, and you got the heart. You got him. You got the heart of all because above all, the priest is the love of the heart of Jesus Christ. The priest is friendship. That's the definition of priesthood. It's friendship with Jesus Christ. Do you know what Jesus Christ looks at when he looks at a priest? He looks at his best friend. So if I'm the devil, if I'm the evil one, I can get his best friend. I'm getting him where it hurts most. I'm getting him where he's most sensitive. I'm taking out his best friend. And that's what hurts him most. Really want to get at his heart, whether or not the priest knows it. When he gets the priest, he's getting Jesus right where it hurts. You are the love of the heart of Christ. So a priest separated from these sacraments is, is a priest separated from his vocation, his ministry. And as our bishop said, we have a very good bishop. He understands this very well. This whole relationship of bishop and priests is, is essential because that's, that's what the bishop is as well. He's not just like the head of a business. The bishop is, is, is in charge of fomenting and making grow this, this love of the priest for his vocation. So the bishop's always supposed to be with the priest. I had, I had one priest tell me, he's like, look, I would love to have young men live at my house to like, you know, form them and, and get them excited about the priesthood. But ever since McCarrick, like, you know, I couldn't even think about that. You know what that would, but the news would come out like, oh yeah, like young men live with priests. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, the thing has been tainted. But our bishop, by the way, he calls us on our birthdays. It's, it's, it's the craziest thing. There's so many like priests in the diocese and uh, I'm doing missions here in Ireland. You get a phone call just like saying happy birthday. You know, like he's, he does take it very seriously. Like this closeness to the priest, this forming of the priest. But he'll have this. He'll have us over, and and he'll and he'll be and he'll be attentive to us, and he'll be and he'll be looking out to taking care of after us. This this is the heart of 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 the priesthood. It, uh, you united to the heart of Christ. It, where does that happen? That happens in adoration. That happens in your one to one in the mass and how you celebrate the mass. As our bishop said, sorry, just to go back to this. He says, I don't want administrators of the death of the diocese talking to us priests. He's like, I don't want you to be administering the death of the diocese. <laughs> so people come in, they're asking for sacraments. You know, like you get this, the most typical thing. I want to get baptized. I want my baby baptized. I want first communion. Um, my, my daughter's getting married. What do I have to do? You, uh, what, where do I have to sign? What papers do I have to fill out? You're in there like, okay, yep. You do have to sign this. This is what you call this. And here we go. We'll have a meeting there. You're administering, doing the paperwork. They come in, ba ba. you do the ceremony. Everything's great, but they leave. The next come in, next flock, boom, same thing. Okay, sign here, you're administrating, boom, they leave. You're administering the death of the diocese. You're forming part of a system that doesn't work anymore. It's done. Keep the show on the road. Keep it going. Keep signing the papers. The show's off the road. It's gone. We need a renewal, a revival, and that starts in the heart of the priest. The priest is the center of this renewal, of this revival. You get a priest to realize that he is the love of the heart of Christ, that this is an intimate friendship. You got everything. It's over. Game over. The cure, the cure of ours. Game over, priest. The devil said, if I had, if there was three more of you, my job would be done. And what was he doing? What was a curie of ours doing? You tell me he was doing something absolutely extraordinary. You know, some crazy pastoral plan that he thought of. He was close to the heart of Christ on his knees, praying, sacrificing, loving. Segundo Llorente, Spanish missionary in Alaska. He would spend nights with his head resting against the tabernacle. Sometimes you'd go up to the tabernacle and you'd just hug the tabernacle and you'd hold it close to his chest. Resting on the heart of Christ resting on his chest where do you rest if if as priests we're not resting on his heart in prayer and eucharistic adoration impossible you're going to have energy to do anything absolutely impossible and sooner or later you're going to lose the fervor you're going to lose the love that first love and you will become an administrator an administrator of some system and you're going to burn out you're going to burn out. You're going to get tired. It's going to get to you. Frustration. It's going to be over. Game over. Because you lost the intimacy. You lost the closeness. It's done. It's all over. Head on his chest. Eucharistic adoration. Find a spot in your house. Yes, in your house, set up a chapel, an oratory, where you can have intimacy. He's your best friend. Why'd you become a priest? Maybe you don't even know it. 
He does, though. It's not you who have chosen me. I have chosen you because I want you to be my best friend. Because you know, as priests, every Friday in the office, every, every Friday, right? So you have four different Fridays, four weeks. Um, we pray one of the Psalms. Out of all four Psalms, every single time, either the word brother or friend comes out. And it's the Lord speaking in the Psalm. As a friend we used to walk through the marketplace hand in hand. You've betrayed me, and it feels like the like the betrayal of a brother. It's a language of brotherhood and friendship. And we read that as priests every Friday. Different Psalms, four different Psalms talking about the dynamic dynamic of brotherhood and friendship with God. Zechariah. Zechariah says, What are these wounds that I see on your chest? And the Lord responds, these are the wounds that were inflicted on me at my friend's house. These are the wounds that were inflicted at me at my friend's house. In the church, my friend's house, my priest, while he was celebrating Mass, disrespectfully, irreverently, in a state of mortal sin. These are the wounds that were inflicted on me at my friend's house. Shepherds, that's us. A shepherd is the best friend of Jesus Christ. And Our Lady's concerned about it. Um, she's come down to tell us about it in the messages to Father Gobi. We said this the last time. She said, the reason for my tears is from the irreverence of my little ones. Little ones referring to her priests. In Sino Jesu, this is a great book that was written by a Benedictine monk here in Ireland. In Sino Jesu, we're going to put that in the description because, look, this book has to make it into the hands of priests right now. This is, this is a book that is starting a revolution because it's getting priests to go back to Eucharistic Adoration. That's the start. A priest starts his Eucharistic Adoration. That's where things start. It's game over, like I said. You start the Adoration one-to-one -one with our Lord, and that's the beginning of the end for the devil. And that's the beginning of the parish. That's the beginning of your mission. That's the beginning of everything. The Eucharistic Adoration, heart-to-heart, one-to-one. Our Lady speaks to this Benedictine monk, and she says... The eighth sorrow of my heart, so this is typically the traditional seven sorrows, but she says, the eighth sorrow of my heart comes from the coldness of my Lord's loved ones, the closest ones to him, their indifference to the sacrament of love, their lack of zeal of promoting the sacrament of love, their lack of, of reverence, their indifference before the blessed sacrament, walking in front of the tabernacle, not even noticing who's in there. That's the seventh, that's the eighth sorrow of my heart. That's in Sino Jesu, Our Lady, to this Benedictine monk. It, the, the, it's getting out of control. The mystics across the board have seen, have had experiences of mass. They've been in mass. Um, Blessed Margarita of Cortonia, she said she saw a priest celebrating mass, and all of a sudden the host turned into this brilliantly white, like pure child, the child Jesus. And as he was dealing, like went to grab the baby, he didn't see it. He was just grabbing the host. His hands, she saw, were jet black. They were black and nasty and kind of like sticky. And she said her heart, like she felt this, this intense pain. And she, she like, said she almost fainted. And she cried out to the Lord, Lord, stop this, Lord, what's going on? And he says, you need to pray and offer up sacrifices for this priest because she was she was just about to say like lord like wipe him out like it, what is going on here he, and, and she could see his sins what were the cause of the color of his hands and um, where he had been and it was disgraceful and there was a lot of impurity and he says once you start your prayers and sacrifices for this priest the devil will enter into despair because he will see that he's lost another one she did and effectively he had a turnaround and um, he himself had a little bit of illumination of conscience, and he was God-smacked. He couldn't believe it, and he had this conversion. And she had a bit of an epiphany moment because her first reaction was to say, like, you know, like, you know, your first reaction. Like, what is this guy doing celebrating Mass? What is this priest doing up there? Prayer and sacrifice, and you'll see how the devil despairs. That's us right now, all right? Because the spirit of criticism is entering into our hearts. How come Joe Biden can go visit the Pope for so long and then come out saying that the Pope said I'm a good Catholic? You say that to a lot of faithful Americans right now, and you're going to be pushing a lot of wrong buttons. Uh, because Joe Biden publicly uh, supports abortion. Have we forgotten about that? That, you know, Joe Biden is for something that the church publicly says is wrong. And it doesn't have to be the church. You can say it with your, your head that you're killing a little baby. From the moment of conception, you know, what do we need? We need to restudy biology and science to see that everything is there 
What do you want? Why don't you go look at an acorn, right? Look at an acorn and then be surprised that you see a tree there. Oh, really? It's all on that acorn, everything. Yeah, it is. The moment of conception. And Big Buddy Joe is saying that, uh, yeah, well, look, my, I'm not going to let my personal beliefs get involved with politics here. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't say you're Catholic and vote for abortion. You can't say you're Catholic and follow that. And all of a sudden, you're saying that he said that you're a good Catholic. Do you know, you know how many buttons that's pushing right now? Do you know, like, in the time where, like, a lot of people can't even go to Mass because they don't have a vaccine? Like, I, I mean... You, you're getting priests and um, bishops mandating their priests to voluntarily step down from the priesthood if they don't get a jab because they're threatening the public. You know, so you're getting people confused saying they got this coming from the church at one end. And then from the other end, you're saying he said, I'm a good Catholic and I can receive communion. Gosh, how are you not going to let the spirit of criticism and bitterness get into your heart with that? How are you going to stop that? What do you think? What do you think that like this, you know, like what, that we were supposed to just ignore this and just keep going and saying like, oh, sure, like it's, it's OK, like, you know, we'll get over this. You recognize it, you see it. And then that's when you turn to prayer and penance. These demons will only be cast out through prayer and penance. You know, because if we let the spirit of criticism get in there, if we lose our joy and if we let that bitterness get in there, we're done. We're done. Maybe there's too much vortex going on. Maybe you have to examine your conscience. If you're watching too much of the bad. Because we know it's there. And I'm not saying it's not. And I'm not saying that we're supposed to be ignoring it and not knowing that's going on. You know, there is a bit of righteous anger that, you know, you say like, look, Lord, come down, please, and clean the temple once again. Get a bigger whip this time because there's more of them. <laughs> All right. All right. I give you that. I understand. But if you notice in your heart that that bitterness has crept in and you do have that, that, that little vial that's gotten in there. Be very careful because that's staining charity. And I don't care if you're right and if you're prophesizing and if you're flying and levitating. If you don't have charity in your heart, you're done. If you don't have charity in your heart, you don't have God because God is charity. And there's nothing more threatening to your charity and to your love than a spirit of criticism and bitterness. It sneaks in there. It sneaks in there. There are priests with black hands celebrating Mass. That's true. There, it's true. Padre Pio had a vision on Good Friday. Loads of priests putting on their vestments, taking off their vestments, celebrating Mass. And he sees the Lord amidst them getting scourged and ripped apart. And our Lord looks up in pain at these priests. And he says one word. He says, butchers. <laughs> butchers. And Padre Pio is stunned. He can't believe it. Faustina, in her diary, our Lord says, I am going to permit that all these convents and monasteries be destroyed because the ones that are supposed to be closest to my heart are the ones that are most offending me. Religious. The religious who we have married God. We have given up everything for God, to be with God, to think about God, to be friends with God. Priests. You don't, you don't have a family. You don't have a country. You don't belong to anything or anybody but God. And they're the ones that are most offending me, the closest ones to me. It is you, my friend, the first to betray me. And he says, I'm going to permit that these convents and monasteries be destroyed. St. Faustina, our Lord to her heart. So look, it's there. It's there, and we recognize it, and we know it, and we feel the pain. What's our reaction? What are we going to do? Is it all over? <laughs> are you going to look around? You're going to say, look, the average age of people in Mass right now... I would say 70, where I am. I don't know where you are. Maybe you got loads of young people there, and it's just unbelievable. And like the vocations are just like, there's too many of them. You know, I send them off to Africa and India again, you know? It, what are we going to do in 10 years? Is it all done? Is it all over? Is a priest going to start mass? And he's going to say, look, I don't need a microphone because there's no one out there to hear me. I'll just start streaming again. Maybe someone out there and a message in a bottle, just throw it out there. Maybe they'll hear me. What's going to happen? Is this the end? Our Blessed Mother and Garib and came down and said, that we have to do more sacrifices. Visit the Eucharist. And this is where I'm going to come to you personally. How much time do you personally spend with the Eucharist? All right? Because I know like priests, that has to be a dead giveaway. We have to be making a holy hour every day. Right? We're gonzo if we're not. And yourself, how much time are you spending with him? You know, if you're spending more time watching the vortex and watching what's going wrong in the world, you know, and if that time is more than your time spending with him, something's wrong. Because you're filling your heart and your mind with all the bad stuff that's going on, all right? And then in your heart, where is he? 
Maybe you were supposed to be that consolation for him and reparation for all that stuff that's going on out there. Maybe like you knowing about it uh, made you like responsible to maybe give him a bit of balsam on that wound in his heart. Spending time with a man of adoration, a lonely God, as little Nelly said. Little Nelly of Holy God. Holy God, she would call him. He's on lockdown. Her dad was a jailer. So she was used to seeing guys get locked up in Spike Island here in Cork. You know, <laughs> He's on lockdown. God's on lockdown again. He's in his box. Can I go visit him? He's on lockdown. Why don't you go visit a God on lockdown so lonely? Maybe that's what he's looking for. Maybe he's looking for a gaze. Maybe he's looking for a bit of affection. You know, maybe we've kind of seen him as St. Faustina also said in her diary, as he himself said, they see me as a cold, inanimate object locked up in a box. Cold, inanimate object. Why don't I go in there and warm him up? Why don't I go in there and say a word to him? Give him a bit of a gaze. Give him a bit of my time. Shouldn't that be where we're focusing right now, don't you think? Don't you think that, the, yeah, it's going to hell in a handbasket? Totally agree. I'm not going to disagree with you. But if I still have the opportunity to go and see him, am I not going to take it? Because be careful, that opportunity actually might be taken away again. Sniffing another lockdown. As they say here in Ireland, we're sleepwalking into another lockdown. We're all sleeping. And before you know it, boom, you hit it once again. This time next month, we're in a lockdown, you know? And what's going to happen in a lockdown? You can't do it anymore. You know? That's what I'm saying. Like, why don't you live in this present moment and spend more time with him in the Blessed Sacrament? Less and less importance is given to it. Make more sacrifices. Meditate on the passion. You know, nothing is going to charge you up more than meditating on the passion when you see what God goes through to fight fight for your gaze. What God goes for goes through just to maybe like hear him, hear you say his name. That's, that's what he did. That's what the passion is. The passion, it, it's a passionate God, a loving God, madly in love with you. I've heard a story and I've been getting loads of mileage out of it in these past couple of days because I think it's a story that's for our times that we're living right now. It came from one of our brothers who spent uh, a year with the missionaries of charity. He was discerning with them before he joined us, uh, the male branch, and he would work with the sisters every day in Washington, D.C., and he told me that the sisters were crazy for um, their mass. He said they lived for the mass. Like they, they couldn't, you know, go a day without the mass. Thanks be to God. That's a real religious sister. Like <laughs> a religious sister that says, like, if I don't spend time with my spouse, I dry up and I'm done. Spend time with him so I can give time to others. That's the philosophy or whatever you want to call it. And they're dead right. So they said it was hard because sometimes they couldn't get a priest. They didn't have a permanent chaplain. Chaplain. And um, they found themselves around Halloween time. Um, they had to drive a bit further this time, and they went to a mass. It was two sisters, superior and a sister. Uh, they walked into the church. They're a bit taken aback um, because there was Halloween decorations, cobwebs, a bit odd. They got there early so they could say their prayers before mass. And uh, slowly, the parishioners started coming in. They could tell it was a children's mass because they're all little kids. And they were all dressed up. Ghouls, goblins, witches, wizards, weird skeleton things, you know. And the sister turns to the mother superior and she's like, um, yeah, bit taken aback with the cobwebs. But uh, do you think maybe now we could leave? You know, <laughs> I've just seen like all these kids come in. It's all silence. The mom, mother superior is dead. She's praying. Um, priest comes out to celebrate and he comes out dressed as a wizard. A crystal ball and everything. Puts the crystal ball down there before the altar. Starts to mass in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the sister turns to the mother and she says, uh, really? Um, how about now? You know, how about now after that? Your man comes out, Father Gandalf, you know, like, are we going to seriously stay here? And the mother superior dropped a bomb. And these words I want you to just drill into your heart. Brand them in there. And don't let them escape. Protect them. She said, if he's going through this, we're going through this. <laughs> Can you believe that? Amidst, like, you're in a Halloween mass, okay? The priest is dressed as a wizard, but he's validly celebrating the mass. If he's an ordained priest and his intentions are to do what the church wants, which is consecrate what is bred into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, God, Jesus Christ, in all of his humility, in his littleness, in his weakness, obeys the words of the priest. Can you, can you believe that? 
that God obeys the priests, knowing that he's going to come down into a chaotic, and if I might say satanic environment, who who's behind this? You know, is who's behind this? Is it the government? It's Satan. And he's coming down into this environment where he's going to be badly treated, beaten up once again, disrespected, sacrileged, indifference, mockery. He's there. And imagine if these sisters would have left. They would have deprived him of the one consolation that he was going to receive in that mass. Because he know he knows he was going to go into a heart that was going to accept him, that was going to take him in, that was going to love him, that was going to nurture him, that was going to protect him, that was going to, that was going to smother him in tenderness. If he's going through this, we're going through this. We're going to put up with all of this, with all of this crap, because he is. And if he's suffering it, we're suffering it with him. And if we can be that constellation, we're going to be that constellation for him. Think about your masses. The next time you complain, think about these sisters as well. Okay, the music's bad. The priest doesn't, you know, do a good job. If he's going through this, why aren't you going through this with him? Are you going to leave him? Are you going to go up and ask for a blessing because you can't receive on the tongue? Do you think that makes him happier than if you were to receive him on the hand? Do you think you receiving on the hand and bringing him into your heart, don't you think that's going to give him a consolation? Whereas if you go up for a blessing or if you don't go up at all, don't you think you're depriving him of going into a safe spot? Have you thought of that? My gosh, I don't have consecrated hands. This isn't about... I'm not for communion in the hand. John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Pope Pius VI, um, Benedict XVI, I studied in Rome. You couldn't go to a Vatican Mass as a priest and give out communion on the hand. You had a little bodyguard next to you with an umbrella, you know, and he says, Padre, la boca. You, you couldn't give it to anybody. In the hand. Like people come up on their hands. You weren't allowed to give it in the hand because that was Vatican rules. And the Vatican wanted everybody to see this is how we celebrate and this is how we should celebrate. The communion in the hand, it was, it was a way the Protestants mocked the Catholics. Luther received on the tongue. He didn't believe in the Eucharist, but it was still this tradition that this is holy bread. Luther received on the tongue. It was Calvin who introduced receiving on the hands because he wanted to mock the Catholics, telling them that this is not, this isn't, this isn't like sacred, okay? It's, it's, it's a piece of bread I'm putting on my hand. And now Catholics do that. <laughs> I mean, just out of like a bit of pride, wouldn't you want to not do it knowing that they did that to make fun of you, to mock you? It's no surprise that over 70% of Catholics don't believe in the Eucharist. It's no surprise because we become like Protestants. So I'm not saying that like, you know, like, okay, there's, there's like, oh, give me the hand. It's no big deal. No big difference. Not at all. But if your priest is not letting you receive on the tongue and you can't receive the Lord unless you receive him in the hand, don't you think that you're the only consolation that he could probably receive in that mass by you receiving him? Stop thinking about your hands not being consecrated or you not being worthy. Um, let me help you. You're not worthy. I'm not worthy. That's why we say at every Mass, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. You said the word in absolution. You gave me absolution and confession. I'm going to come up and receive you because I need to live by you. I need you. And by the way, I'm going to comfort you in this moment. Like, what did you think about that? The consecrated hands thing is St. Thomas Aquinas. You're right. But it's not magisterium. And if you go away from magisterium of the church, I'm very sorry. You're going away from mom. You're leaving your mother. That's what magisterium is. She protects, she nurtures the teaching. St. Thomas Aquinas said, consecrated hands, touch the Eucharist. St. Thomas Aquinas, no problem with him. Never going to never gonna have a problem with him. You know, who am I to say anything about St. Thomas Aquinas? But it's not church magisterium that you have to have consecrated hands. So, like, we're not even going to get into that. Like, like I said, I'm not fighting for receiving in the hand. But I'm saying if you can't receive, and that's the only way you're going to receive, receive him. Because he needs you. He needs to get in there. He needs that safe spot. And that's what our Blessed Mother is telling to us. That's what she's warning us about. That's what she's egging us on because nobody knows better than her that the priest is the best friend, is, is the other Christ. She sees us as little Christs. And when the devil gets a priest, he really, really digs into the heart of Christ and he digs into the immaculate heart of our Blessed Mother. That's why she's building up an army of priests. That's why she's building up an army of priests who, who are doing Eucharistic adoration, who are getting 
life out of their ministry. You guys get life out of your ministry, please. If there's priests listening or if you guys can get this to priests, get this to priests because as a priest, you receive life in in your ministry. You know, confessing. Uh, I went to the petrol station the other night, the gas station, and it was in a rush. Really bad afternoon. Things were going crazy. Bumped into a guy who had a 30 rack of beer in his hands, asked me for the blessing. I said, we'll do it afterwards. <laughs> bad, bad moment, right? See him come out of the gas station. He left his beer. He came out alone. And uh, he asked me for the blessing. I gave him the blessing. And I said, look, don't you think you need a confession? Because like the stuff he was asking me to bless, like I said, look, man, let's just do a confession. Uh, we ended up sitting in the car for an hour. And he said to me that he was going to drink the 30 rack and he was going to jump into the river. That was going to be his evening. And he would have been one amongst many who have done the same thing. Drink the 30 rack and jump into the river. He said when he was sitting there having the chat, it was an hour, like I said, he just felt slowly how like this anxiety was just getting off of him. And he was just like, and it was the most basic thing, you guys. It was nothing huge or out of the extraordinary. It was a chat. He says sometimes he goes to the petrol station to see if someone will make spike up a conversation with him. He's lonely. Gosh, he's had a hard life. He's had a hard life. It's sad. It's sad. And like as a priest, you feel like you took that burden off of him. You feel like you were in there in the moment as an instrument of God getting to him. And you feel God saying thank you to you. You see him saying thank you for being me in that moment for him. Because he was going to be in the river. He was done. This was two nights ago. And you get life out of this. You give life and you receive life. If you are not practicing your ministry, know that it will dry up. Practice your ministry. You're a priest of God. You're a man of God. You represent Jesus Christ. Get this out of your head that you're not worthy or that, like, okay, I have to be with the people. Maybe I'm going to dress differently. Yet you're not worthy. And you don't have to separate yourself from the people. Smell like the sheep. It's a good thing. But, but you represent Jesus Christ. You're a different person now after your ordination. Stop. Get it out of your head that, that anything else. It's a lie. Take back your priesthood because they need you. We need you. And all of you out there, instead of criticizing, please, God, pray for priests because we have a bullseye on our head. The devil hates us because he sees Christ in us. The number one hated person in all humanity is the priest. So there you go. Join the boat and start like criticizing him again. You know, fill yourself with bitterness while you're at it. You just fell into his trap. Pray for him. Take a bit of sugar out of your coffee in the morning, maybe. For me. <laughs> for all the priests, make a little sacrifice. And say like this, I'm doing for my shepherd because I'm the sheep and I need him. I need him to be holy. That's the way God wanted it. He set up shepherds among, according to his own heart. And that's what the priesthood is. Let's take Mary back by storm. We need to take her image back because a lot of people say like, oh, she, she's just effeminate um, and she makes you effeminate. You know, it's an effeminate devotion. She's far from it. Um, but, you know, when she heard, blessed are you among women, that has only been said twice in scripture. This was the third time in the New Testament, twice in the Old Testament. You can look up Judges, Jael. Jael was a fierce, scary woman. She drove a tent spike through the head of Sisera, the enemy of Israel, uh, she crushed his head with a ten spike and a mallet. Um, yeah, she was a prefigure of Mary. Judith cut off the head of Holofernes. It's the book of Judas. Judith saved the people of Israel by also crushing the head of the enemy. Who's Mary? She's the woman of Genesis, the one that crushes the head of the ancient serpent, the devil, the liar from the beginning, who's been telling us lies since the day we were born, about ourselves, about our, our husband, about our wife, about everybody around us, about the world, about the church. He's a liar. Stop listening to him. Get him out of your life. Get her into your life so she crushes his head. That's what she does. She's a fierce woman. She's not going to make you effeminate. She's going to make you She's gonna make you a man. And if you're a woman, she's going to make you a strong woman to face these times that we're in. We need her. We need Mary. We need her. These are the times of our blessed mother. That's why she's coming down. That's why she's so worried. And uh, that's why we're gonna. That's why we have to pray the rosary, get close to her, and ask her for her protection and her help. So may Almighty God help us. Please pray for us, priests. Um, see the documentary on Garibin Dahl. Please God watch this documentary on Father Henry as well, and get this documentary out there because you guys like. Look, if you get these videos out and you know you subscribe, you do everything you're supposed to do. Like that helps the algorithm, you know, and it gets this stuff out there extended. It's a way of evangelizing. You've never had evangelizing so easy. Just spend a bit of time, like, 
diffu- like getting this out there, get a bit of diffusion there. So please, God, um, this, this message may hit our hearts, and we may pray and ask for good shepherds according to the heart of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.